Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and this is a mid-September wrap-up. I'm going to try to keep this short because the energy is low and while filming doesn't take always that much energy, editing does and so does subtitling. So for the thumbnail I read these books plus a couple of ebooks. First of all, last month's book club book was The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. This has a really nice cover. I really like this. It very much reminds me of the cover of Wild Beauty, The Darkness and the Flowers. It is a dual timeline story. This one is about an apothecary from 1770s, I think, who made poisons to poison men with, specifically men. They don't have to have done anything particularly bad. A woman just has to want them dead. And it is very quickly obvious how important and helpful this work is because she is giving women a way to defend themselves from rapists and abusers, etc. because the law really didn't give a care about women uh, in the 1700s. It doesn't really now either, <laughs> but at least we can get divorces now. What was framed very much is that I had no moral qualms with the past main character. I had no problem with this provider of poisons until it, you find out later on the story that she, she doesn't have very high standards for who she gives poisons to. <laughs> and it all starts with her being ticked off at a man in her past, which is not explicitly stated but made quite clear fairly early on in the book. I really like apothecaries. I have... the main characters for several of my books are that I have in my head, um, one that I've published, are apothecaries. Uh, potion making just really fascinates me. But it is framed by the book in such a way that even if you don't agree with, that even if you have moral problems with what the apothecary is doing, it's still an enjoyable book. Then there's the other timeline, which was less interesting to me. Present timelines tend to be. I like historical fiction because it's more escapist, probably, and the way I find the, the differences in the way things worked in the olden days versus how they work now interesting, and it, like, brings me into a story more. But the current timeline lady um, is named Caroline, and she has run away from America, where she normally lives, in the wake of finding out her husband has been cheating on her, and has come on what was supposed to be her 10th anniversary trip that was already booked and paid for, um, to spend some time away from him, basically. The trip had been booked to London, and she is someone who's very interesting, interested in history, and was planning on being a historian before married and family happened. So she decides to go mudlarking, which is a thing where you go along the banks of the River Thames, I assume in specific places where more stuff washes up because of currents and stuff, and you try to find stuff that is washed up because people throw a ton of trash into the River Thames, and they used to throw out more of it, but even really old stuff is still washing up because of the way that water works. Um, and so she finds a bottle from this apothecary that has a little symbol of a bear on it that is her clue that leads her into doing a bunch of research and learning about this apothecary and her story. And we find out the apothecary story both through actually reading from her perspective and also a young girl's perspective who is in her timeline and hangs out with her and also through Caroline's perspective of historically figuring out what happens. Once we got into the actual research and stuff that Caroline was doing I really enjoyed that because I like discovering hidden histories especially about women that's also very much up my alley. It's like there are a lot of elements that are very much make this book for me. It was a little bit slow at times and especially the times when Caroline was thinking of forgiving her piece of garbage husband or talking about how her life had been since she had gone the marriage and family route and had given up on her dreams um, and how sad that all was. That was kind of hard to read and unpleasant to read, I guess. Um, so there were parts of it that I didn't enjoy, but I almost always enjoyed the past timeline parts and I enjoyed the research parts of the 
current timeline. I'm talking too much about this book. I like this book a lot. It was not my favorite book ever just because I didn't find as much to latch on to in the character dynamics as I usually like. Yeah. And because most of the people were miserable throughout the entire book, there were only little bit parts of it where they were like um, having a good time or feeling hopeful. So that put a bit of a downcast on the whole book. It's that kind of story. It has some angry feminist energy. It doesn't have very chill feminist energy. It's angry feminist energy, which I personally really enjoy um, because I find unleashing one's anger especially in a fictional or poetic form to be very cathartic if that part would ruin the book for you probably don't pick it up then i read something to say by lisa moore remay uh who's also the author of the good kind of trouble or a good kind of trouble which i've heard about but i don't feel like i know all of what it's about um but it's another middle grade this is a middle grade and it's about a very clearly neurodivergent child who makes friends with another clearly neurodivergent child it seems like a autistic and adhd pairing which happens a fair amount we get along fairly good and tend to complement each other and that autistic people tend to be a bit more withdrawn and the adhd person can do a little bit of the drawing out and the reaching out that sometimes needs to happen to make a friendship with an autistic person work that's the case in the book uh what's it called show us who you are and but it doesn't openly talk about neurodivergence like she's not labeled as anything it's just very obvious if you are neurodivergent that like yeah that person's that character's brain works like mine does um and it's got all the telltale signs of a little social reject who doesn't know how to talk to people and likes to wear weird clothes and <laughs> has a very obvious special interest. Also some banging social anxiety and the like overarching plot thing is a name change for the school and that interacts with the actual main plot which is the relationship between our main character and her neurodivergent friend. The whole something to say thing is about even though she's socially anxious and withdrawn and doesn't have any friends except this person who decides to be friends with her, her thoughts are still valuable and worth communicating and worth other people listening to. My voice is getting a little <laughs> a little froggy because I'm I've been what I would call weepy and what my mom calls being emotionally labile um for like three weeks now ever since I started switching my antidepressants I'm changing my medications right now and that tends to make you a little chemically unstable um and I <laughs> blubbered at the end of this book I also blubbered at the end of Luca I just recently watched the Disney movie Luca but yeah made me emotional <laughs> because of the neurodivergent thing and because I am emotionally labile which is like being a lot of people get that way when they're PMSing it was very good and I highly recommend it uh, it doesn't say like I said she's not labeled any particular way in the book which makes me think that the author may be uh, undiagnosed um, but sh but the author may also just be keeping it to themselves because a lot of people prefer to do that. Um, I read Aisha at Last by Uzma Jalaladin, and at the time I read this I had forgotten that it was a Pride and Prejudice retelling and I didn't remember that although I knew it when I requested the book when I finally like when that memory triggered it like the whole thing came back and I remembered that I did know that. I didn't realize it until the second time <laughs> that the book pulled a direct quote and reused it from that from Pride and Prejudice. Um, and it is set in Canada in modern day-ish um, and uh, amongst a Muslim community which is a very good place to set a Pride and Prejudice retelling because a lot of modern Pride and Prejudice retellings struggle with the fact that things like men and women not talking to each other uh, very much and having a lot of social rules about talking to each other and also the whole need to get married thing um, are not present so trying to make an Austin plot work in modern day doesn't work very well because society's expectations are very important 
to Austin's plots, um, and they are much more important in Muslim communities than they are in especially secular communities, but even like Protestant Christian, but even like American Christian communities aren't quite to the point where an Austin plot <laughs> would make sense. A lot of Austin retellings also struggle with sticking too close to the plot and making it not make sense for the characters and the different setting, but I really liked how this one differed enough that it made sense for a different set of characters and a different setting. Um, because, which is why I didn't realize <laughs> or remember what it was until the second dropped in quote. So this is about two Muslim people meeting, um, being kind of sort of half introduced <laughs> awkwardly by a mutual acquaintance, um, and them judging each other really harshly um, because of a bad first meeting and also to be fair because the main male character is a bit of a fundy which um, was very interesting to see that Muslims also refer to fundamentalist religious Muslims as that the way that Christians do and fundy Christians are extremely unpleasant people who tend to be very sexist among other things. In Christianity, they're also very racist. I don't know how that applies to Muslims, but having, but I've had a fair amount of exposure to fundy Christians and have quite a, rather an, a, an intense dislike for them. Um, and I also had a bit of a confrontation with someone who was using Christianity to prop up sexism on Facebook at the time I was reading the beginning of this book, which was not great timing because it made me really irritated at the main <laughs> hero of the book, which is a departure from Mr. Darcy uh, because Darcy is not particularly religious. Approximately the same amount of sexist as all the other men, whereas most of the men in the heroine's life are not fundamentalists and are not very sexist at all. Um, I actually really, really like uh, pretty much all of the male characters from this book who aren't just little side characters. And as we go through the book, we learn more about Khalid. His name's Khalid. We learn more about Khalid and, like with Darcy, about why he is the way he is <laughs> and um, about how the initial judgments that they both are judgy of each other is a lot based on misunderstanding. On her part, she was kind of right about him. He was being judgy and she judged him for being judgy, um, whereas he judged her for being in a bar. And it was it was quite similar to how in the ballroom scene in Pride and Prejudice, Darcy makes a nasty little comment, mostly for the purpose of getting his friend off his back because he's matchmaking and leave me the frick alone. Um, and Elizabeth overhears it and is very offended. Um, not as offended as Ayesha though. Ayesha was much more offended. <laughs> and we see how they have bad opinions of each other that gradually change because they are put together because they are working on an event for their mosque, which is way more interaction than Darcy and Elizabeth have. And so the first quote that feels like it's very dropped in and not organic to the story um, or to the characters, because modern characters don't talk like that. <laughs> they don't talk like uh, lower upper class English people from 1810. Um, so it felt kind of weird and also it's a very quotable quote and it felt weird because I expected Aisha to comment on it because in the book not only does Jane Austen exist but Pride and Prejudice, Pride and Prejudice specifically exists. Aisha has read it and she has a poster of Jane Austen on her wall. How would she not notice when the hero quoted that very big quotable quote, which was um, a back and forth of her saying, your flaws to da 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 da, and him saying, and yours is to willfully misunderstand them. And the second time when I actually realized that it was fully a retelling was when the proposal goes epically wrong in a pretty much the exact same way that it goes wrong with Darcy does it. And I just didn't feel like that proposal was something that Khalid would say. Like specifically it was the liking her against his better judgment issue and it's like although he's intensely awkward and 
and like can't talk about his feelings and such, I don't feel like Khalid, as he has been established in the rest of the book, would specifically tell her that he liked her against his better judgment. So that felt a little bit awkward and not in tune with the rest of how well the plot and characters were changed to make sense with these characters. It felt a bit heavy-handed. Um, but it is the author's debut novel and it might be that she wanted to make it more obvious that it was a Pride and Prejudice retelling because Pride and Prejudice, Pride and Prejudice retellings sell better. Um, or the publisher slash editor may have told her to do that. The Mr. Wickham plot arc part also felt quite dropped in and not very organic to the rest of the story. So like there was a very much a mix of organic and dropped in mixing of retelling and original story. That was a bit awkward, but debuts tend to be a bit awkward, especially when they are retellings. But overall, once we figure out why Khalid is the way he is, and especially once he has some character growth, um, I like the romance a lot. They were quite cute, even if he initially liked her because she was pretty. Men just be like that. My favorite part was actually the Aisha's relationship with her family. She had very cool family. Um, it was very much an intergenerational taking care of each other thing. And so she lived with her brother, her mom, and her grandparents. And they were living in a house that had been given to, given to them by her uncle who was rich. And they had actually lived also with the uncle and his whole family for a while. And I really liked her dynamics with them. That was those kind of complicated familial relations, but also really sweet relationships with both her grandparents and like I feel like a lot of books just cuts it off doesn't even have the main character have a mean meaningful relationship with their parents let alone with even older people like grandparents um so I really like that that was brought in I don't think I've seen an own voices review for this I think I picked this up from some non-muslim booktuber but it seemed fairly in line with the representation that I saw in uh, Love from A to Z, which I did see recommended by a known voices uh, Muslim reviewer. Once again, not as to as great of a degree as in Love to A to Z, but still in this one I can see a lot of parallels between Muslim communities and the Christian communities that I have grown up in. So that is always interesting, being like seeing differences and similarities. The other books... <laughs> I read should be a bit quicker to tell you about because they are just some romances. I uh, read the newest book in Lisa Kleypas's Ravenel series because that's a series that I have enjoyed a lot. So this one is about a widow who has taken over her husband's shipping business which was basically how most women in those times owned businesses. They were actually able to inherit them, take them over from their husbands, which was basically the only way a woman could be independent, so they had to have been married at some point. Um, but at least women could run businesses that way. But that part was really cool, and she gets involved with a Scotsman who is using her shipping business to ship his uh, alcohol. And there's a lot of details about how whiskey is made at least the whiskey that comes from Scotland because the author got excited and had a fun time researching that <laughs> and so she put it in the book and they have a very cute little relationship um it wasn't as good as a it wasn't to my taste as much as most of the ones from the Wallflower series but I still liked it quite a lot um and I liked how the Scotsman didn't just use Scottish words very occasionally to swear or for endearments. He actually used a Scottish dialect and also fully Scottish words quite a bit just during regular dialogue. So that was more realistic than a lot of um, portrayals of bilingual people. And I also read another book, what's it called? What's it called? By Grace Draven because as I was scrolling through books looking for Ravenel stories, I re-encountered the books that are on my Kindle 
written by Grace Draven. She's a fantasy romance author that I discovered a year ago and I bought my favorite book by her which is Radiance and have it on my shelves so like I remember that one but for some reason don't remember that I really like her other romances too so I'm currently rereading those and the new one that I read is a follow-up novella to the Crow Madge one that I can't remember the title of. It's called The Brush of Black Wings and it was very good and it feels like it, it's setting up for another story so um that's cool. I didn't know there were going to be any more of those and it was very nice to get back into that world and see a bit of the um happily ever after but still cool scary magic going on um that uh happens in these two characters lives. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye!